All right, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Joanne Pritchard and I am an instructional designer for UCLA, uh, supporting Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services, um, especially um, new social workers and ongoing training. And I'm really excited to be here today. So thank you for having us. And good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're participating from. Uh, my name is Emma Black and I am an academic coordinator with the UC Davis Northern Training Academy and in a role very similar to Joanne's. And I'm um, happy to have you all here today for our presentation about From Cans to Plans, Supporting Transformational Change Through Team-Based Case Planning. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and dive right in. We've got quite a lot um, to cover with everyone today. Um, and so for what we hope that you're gonna be able to get out of our time together is that you get a sense of how CANS is being used in California's systems of care, and especially within child and family team meetings. So child and family team meetings are the primary vehicle through which we are looking to engage families, make decisions together. Um, and so we'll talk about the role of the child and family team meetings in developing consensus around CANS ratings with the child, youth, family, and their team, how to translate those CANS ratings into target needs and strengths, and then also differentiating between behaviorally based case plan objectives and service compliance objectives. So that's really been a key piece of the work um, in California over the last several years, and I would imagine in any of your jurisdictions as well, as we really try to get more concrete about what does that behavior change look like. So we'll start by taking a look at our California system of care um, and just what it looks like here and the role that child and family team meetings have within those systems of care. And so this is the definition, right? So service is a service delivery approach that builds partnerships to create a broad integrated process for meeting families' multiple needs. And so we really are striving to have a lot of interagency collaboration. We're wanting to make sure we're um, recognizing and utilizing family strengths in the plans that are being developed, that we're able to have um, families access services within their communities whenever possible, and that there's also some shared responsibility around the plan success and um, and in reaching the goals that we've identified. Um, and making sure that families and youth are really able to have their voice and choice as part of the entire process. And so that's a key piece of the child and family team meetings, especially. And so where this started was um, with California Assembly Bill 403 and also um, the continuum of care reform. And so what this really said was that we wanted to make sure that children were in um, committed permanent families, that they were not in group care, um, that they were with families whenever possible, making sure that their voice and choice was central to all that we were doing, and um, also making sure that we had behavioral and mental health services available to children and youth in their homes, um, and that we were really engaging caregivers in their treatment, um, and also in providing input about what we should be doing and what does that goal possibly look like. And we're also that we are um, making sure that we're nurturing relationships, right? So in child welfare, historically, um, we've done a good job of uh, making sure kids are safe, but we haven't always attended to well being. And that's partly where those relationships come in. And so um, this is really, this has been an effort to make sure that we're paying attention to both um, well being and safety needs of children, youth, and families. And so the approach in California has been to utilize an integrated core practice model, which is really um, some shared values, core components, standards of practice. Um, and this is expected through um, all of the systems that serve children, youth, and families, and specifically child welfare, behavioral health, and probation. And so what this really said was across these three systems, we want to make sure there is an integrated system of care where families aren't being sent off in a bunch of various directions, but that together we're figuring out what families may need and how to make those needs across all these systems in a way that is coordinated and makes sense for families. Um, again, with their voice and choice being part of that. 
And so I'm actually going to stop sharing for a second because I need to pull up a different screen to share. We're going to show a short video um, on the child and family teaming process in California. And so I will do that here. Just give me one second. And as Joanne is queuing that up, it looks like quite a few folks um, have followed my queue in the chat to introduce themselves, but we'd love to know who is in the room with us today. So if you're able to share your um, agency and particularly if it's in not in California, we'd love to know where and your particular role, that would be great. And thanks again for those who have. Graduation, one of life's first milestones. A rite of passage that marks the transition from youth to adulthood, but not for everyone. Dropout rates are two and a half times higher for kids who enter foster care. In college, well, teens who get out of foster care are more likely to live on the streets than in a dorm. In California, we're changing all of that. Let me show you how. Kids typically enter foster care through no fault of their own. Most often a parent is unable to handle the challenges they face. Drug addiction, mental health issues, unhealthy relationships, any or all of which may lead to abuse or neglect. On any given day, there are nearly 60,000 California children and teens in foster care. That's more than one kid for every seat at Dodger Stadium. It is usually a neighbor, a teacher, or a loved one who alerts Child Protective Services. When the social workers determine it's unsafe for a child to remain in the home, they are matched with a nearby resource family, formerly known as foster family. Being removed from their family is traumatic. Then moving in with strangers, missing and worrying about loved ones, so many questions arise. When will I see my family again? Will I ever get to live with them again? All of this uncertainty and stress can cause significant harm to a young person. But every kid's situation is different and every kid is important. We must do everything we can to improve the odds for each and every one of them. That's why California recently adopted an innovative and proven approach to helping kids heal and thrive. It's called the Child and Family Team, also known as CFT. Every child who enters foster care is assigned a team made up of parents, caregivers, experts, therapists, and the youth themselves. The team meets regularly and is led by a trained professional. Using an evidence-based model known as the Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths Tool, the team engages the child or youth in sharing their story to better determine what kind of supports are needed and what strengths and unique interests they may have. They talk about every important area of life, from emotional and behavior issues to risk management. With the young person support system in the room, the silos of communication are shattered, allowing for better coordination of care and a clear path of action to support the child and family's goals. Working together, the team can support her with any challenges she faces. Most importantly, they help her build the skills and confidence she needs to succeed. The CFT model has been proven to change the lives of California's greatest resource, our young people. Every child deserves the opportunity to reach their potential and some need a little more support to get there. Because after all, commencement is just the beginning. All right. 
So we wanted to give you or show that video just so that you could get a sense of some of the work that we've been doing here in California, um, especially around um, the child and family teaming process. Um, and it is important to note that it's a process. It's not just about the meeting itself, but it's really about the entire approach of how do we work with children, youth and families um, to make sure that the plans that are being created are really reflective of their needs and also include things that are really important to them and that it's solutions that will work for their families. So what is a child and family team? Um, this is really, again, all of the people that come together to support um, a child and parent as um, part of the safety network. Um, and this has really been informed by the continuum of care reform, as well as this integrated core practice model. And the child and family team has been identified as the primary way that we live out those values, that we demonstrate the behaviors that we know um, help children and families to be successful. And so our child and family team um, teaming process has some members who are really critical to the process. Um, so we have the child, youth, or non-minor dependent, um, the family and their natural supports are really, really key. And so we have um, really been trying to um, help with this paradigm shift of um, making sure that without a net, or I should say no network, no plan, meaning that we really need to have the family and their natural supports as part of this plan to help make sure it's successful. Uh, the caregiver, social worker, or probation officer, uh, the mental health or behavioral health and our tribal partners, of course, we definitely want them at the table with us. Um, any other professionals that might be identified who are serving the children and families to make sure that, um, again, it's, this is a coordinated process, especially around service delivery. CASA, we also have our trained facilitator. So when they talked about that there was someone who was skilled that runs this meeting, that's our facilitators. And we have a facilitation training process um, that is really comprehensive and helps um, folks to be able to facilitate these meetings and to make sure that the family's needs are met and that we have plans that come out of them that are strong, recognizing the family strengths and also making sure that any of those worries are addressed. And so it's um, a big shift for us to really be thinking about this as the process, not an event. Um, so it's not just about the meeting itself, but it's about all of the conversations that happen that lead up to that meeting. So preparation is really, really key. Joanne, I just wanted to jump in. Um, there's a question in the chat about how often the team meets. And I think that's a great question because um, we talk about both that there is the mandate for the event of the child and family meeting itself, which in California, there are specific guidelines around how often that has to occur. And the child and family team exists outside of the meeting and the process of that continuous teaming and support should be happening beyond when those required meeting intervals are. So in general in California, um, when a child is removed from the home, that is what triggers the mandated CFT process. And we have a, a few slides coming up that will really walk you all through that. Um, and that initial CFT meeting needs to happen within 30 days if the child is um, ICWA, if they're part of a native tribe, or if their initial placement is in a qualified residential treatment program or SDRTP. For all other children, it is within 60 days. And then ongoing meetings need to happen every six months for every child, youth, or every 90 days if they are receiving specialty mental health services. And it looks like someone said they can't see the slides, but other folks can. I can see them, so I think it's working. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Emma. Um, and I appreciate you being able to um, share that. You did a great job of recapping um, all of our CFT timing requirements. So let me go ahead and um, keep moving here. All right, so this slide, um, this is really just meant as an illustration to show you how is it that all of these different things come together. And so this has been one of the more popular um, visuals. This was developed by UC Davis, um, Northern Training Academy. And so we really think about the, the child and family team as um, this is how, um, this is the team. This is how they all play together. Um, the Kansas are scoreboard. So this is a way for us to record and communicate what's happening um, at any point in time and also for us to be able to track progress. 
Um, and the integrated core practice model is really our rules of play, basically. Um, it is how we do the work. Um, we've got our players who we just talked about. These are all of the people that we would want as part of our team. Um, and then the safety organized practice is something that we've been using um, in California for quite some time. Um, and really what this is, is a strategy for engagement and assessment. And so this is kind of, if you think about it, it's kind of like, how do you play the game? It's techniques, strategies, tools, um, skills that you may use. So it's things that you're bringing in. And then our CFT meetings are really more like of a team huddle. So this is how, this is where we get together. This is where we plan next steps. Um, so again, it is really just simply part of the process of the child and family team. The meeting is really a huddle for us to be able to check in, but the child and family team is really how we do the work day in and day out. All right. And so the um, integrated practice child and adolescent strengths and needs tool, we wanted to highlight this because um, California uses the integrated practice cans. And so, um, and again, I know that there are different versions of the cans available in different jurisdictions. Um, and so the California IP cans is our designated cans. And um, this does contain the cans 50 items. And one of the unique pieces about this is that it allows us to assess up to four caregivers. And this was um, part of us wanting to make sure we're addressing not only caregivers that children are currently with. So if they happen to be an out of home placement, we wanna make sure that that caregiver is assessed as part of our cans. But we also wanna make sure that their family of origin is also included um, because children exist within the context of their family. And so we wanna make sure that we are addressing the needs of um, all caregivers that are interacting with this child, especially when we are pursuing reunification. And um, because that helps us to know that caregivers are able to address the needs that, address, that led to children coming into care and also help to make sure that caregivers have um, a sense of what needs to happen to meet that child's needs on a long-term basis. And then the last piece is that it also does include um, it does include a trauma module where we're able to take a look at what are some of the adverse childhood experiences that we know maybe this family has um, experienced. Um, and so we are able to take a look at that. And it's one of the ways that we are specifically attending to trauma. All right. And so I'm going to turn this over to Emma to speak a little bit about integrating CANS into the CFTM. And I'll keep an eye on the chat, Emma, while you're presenting. Thanks, Joanne. And there's some great questions coming in in the chat. I think we're about to cover them, but I'll do kind of a, a check with you um, to see if we covered your question in a moment, Lisa. Um, and just so folks know, Joanne and I are trying to condense material for a full two-day training into this hour-long segment. So we are going to do our best to kind of cover a lot, but we also want this to be interactive and to, you know, meet your needs for questions. So please keep the questions coming. And if we don't answer them along the way, we'll be sure to leave some time. Okay, so when we talk about um, how do we bring the cans into the meeting and where does it fit, we use what's called the Super 8 Child and Family Team Meeting Structure and Process with the way that we facilitate CFT meetings and the way that we train our CFT facilitators in California. So when we're talking about how exactly do we bring this tool into the meeting, it is oftentimes during the introduction, sometimes in the purpose as well, and then during the content phase of the meeting. So in the introduction, we really sort of talk about that CANS as one, one of the, the reasons for the meeting. I think there was a question about, um, is it important to have a scored CANS or an approved CANS during the CFT process? And the answer is yes. We really say that before the child and family team meeting, any scored CANS is a draft CANS. And then the meeting is part of the process of finalizing that CANS and giving the team an opportunity to come to a consensus about those ratings so that we're all on the same page about the priority needs and the strengths that we can use to help to develop the plan. When we talk about the content, there's a really open discussion around what is working well or what are the needs of the child, youth, and the family. 
and what are we, um, sorry, what, what's working well or what are the strengths and what are we worried about or what are the needs? So very often through that open natural discussion, members of the CFT are already talking about some of those domains on the draft cans. But if they are not mentioned, that content portion of the meeting is an opportunity to bring them in and to summarize them. And then when we move into this next phase, which I'll talk about in a minute, we're then figuring out how do we use and prioritize those. So what we really try to teach people, I think there's been a tendency in California to sort of like have our CFT process over here and then to have our CANS process over here. And there has been a bit of resistance in terms of blending both of those. People have felt like, it will make the meeting awkward, it will take way too much time, um, or that it doesn't per se um, align with the particular value of how we have launched our child and family teaming process. When we talk about this organic process, the cans really flows throughout. So in California, we oftentimes have safety planning or prevention child and family team meetings. These are not a mandate, but they are absolutely a best practice. So this meeting might occur right after a child is removed, if there's a risk of removal from the home, if we're working with a family to develop some type of plan to help that child to remain in their home. During that meeting, we have that discussion around what's working well, worries, we come up with next steps, we develop a good action plan. There's great engagement happening that helps us to elicit the needs and strengths of the child and the parent. And during this meeting, someone who is CANS trained and certified might be doing what we call implicitly rating some of the needs and strengths that come up. So they're not actually looking at a CANS form, they're not actually figuring out how it fits into that information, but they have their assessment lens on during that meeting. Then after that initial safety planning meeting, the CANS completer, which is a variety of people in California, sometimes it is the social worker, sometimes it's the child and family team meeting facilitator, sometimes it's a behavioral health clinician, it can really be just about anybody, but they need to start working on that draft CANS. So they might use some of that information gathered in the first CFT meeting, they should be having conversations with lots of different people, conversations with the parents, with the out-of-home caregivers, if there are some, with the child or youth, really with anyone who has good knowledge about what the needs and strengths are of that family. And then they're going to write out a draft CANS. So they're going to start to really think about what are some ratings for what we know right now. Then they bring that draft scored CANS to the child and family team meeting. And during the meeting, they might update those draft scores based on information that is shared, because sometimes there's a member that comes to that CFT meeting that brings in some significant information that we didn't know beforehand. So they might be moving things from a two to a three or from a one to a zero, right? So they're kind of working on that during the meeting. Then they review the CANS needs and strengths that are identified with the team. They work to build consensus on those ratings. They help the team to identify target needs, and then they use the needs or the team, the facilitator kind of helps to uh, create a process where those target needs work um, towards creating a shared vision and some goals or objectives. So that's what happens during that meeting, but let's not forget, right? <laughs> Organic process, the work is not over just because the meeting ends. Then that child welfare social worker does the work of creating a good individualized behavioral based case plan that helps to address those prioritized needs and strengths to build on. And that child's target needs are oftentimes also integrated into a behavioral health treatment plan. Sorry, thank you so much, Emma. I was just messaging you that I had completely gone over your slides. So thank you for that. Sorry. <laughs> and thanks for being flexible. All right. So our safety planning and prevention CFTM, um, this is really a place where we are starting to gather information about the CAN. So um, in some jurisdictions, they're using this 
part of the process to complete a draft CANS to get services in place as quickly as possible, um, especially when there are some priority needs that are identified. So those something that might be like a two or a three that is really impacting functioning. Um, and so anyway, this is starting to inform the CANS and possibly creating um, the, the very first draft um, as we are getting to know the family. And so the first goal is to have a safety plan, if at all possible, to keep the child at home. And so that's the intention of this meeting is to bring everyone together to talk about um, what are the safety needs, um, trying to figure out, um, is it possible to create a plan with the network members, with others who might be involved with this child who now know what the needs are? Um, this is where we are getting really clear about um, the reason for child welfare's intervention. So when we talk about harm and danger statements, this is a very clear articulation of um, what we as child welfare and the family and their network are worried about in regards to the safety of this child and the parent's ability to be able to safely meet their child's needs. Um, this is also where we're developing a safety goal where um, we are talking about what would safety look like in this family? Um, what are the behaviors that we want to see demonstrated that help us to know that the kids are safe? and then developing action steps for the family and the network. And then we also would schedule the, the next CFT. So this one is one we would consider, again, a best practice. It's a way of engaging families from the very beginning. Um, and the information is not going to be specific to gathering information specifically for the CANs, but it is keeping in mind, what are some of those CANs items that we're paying attention to? What are some of the immediate needs of the family that we can start addressing right now from the very beginning before this um, actual process has happened where we're getting all of the different perspectives because this is still very early on in the case um, or in the intervention. Um, and as we get to know the family better, we would be gathering additional information that gets all those different perspectives and helps us to be able um, to support the family. Oops. All right, so someone in the meeting is going to complete the can. So um, ideally that there are blank copies of the cans that are on the table for the family or available to the family, since I know that sometimes we are in fact, um, so just, I'm sorry, so we know that we are in fact um, getting the right information that the families know what it is that we're talking about. Um, and so these can be laminated, people can have dry erase markers, they can kind of be marking things. Um, and then this is a place that we are able to then um, come to the meeting and confirm what it is that the CANS completer has maybe identified. And so this is where the case planning comes alive. So the case planning CFTM, um, this CANS completer is going to bring a copy, a draft copy of the CANS, that pencil version. We're going to make sure we're attending to both um, the danger and safety goals with the family, um, as well as um, the well-being goal for the family. So this is that shared vision that Emma was talking about. So that's safety and well-being. We're attending to both things and making sure that the plan attends to both. Um, so we're discussing worries, working well, building consensus. Um, again, this is where we are coming to some consensus around what is our shared vision, right? So again, what is the main safety issue and what are some of the well-being goals that we need to accomplish? And then we're going to be putting together a plan with the family that addresses those target needs in those areas. Um, so we're also thinking about what are the needs and strengths of the children, youth, and parents. We want those to be part of, an active part of the plan. Um, it also lets us know how worried we should be. So again, how many of those like twos or threes do we have um, here that are not able to be addressed um, with the network or that may need some more formal interventions to address? Um, and what do we want to do about it? And so um, the child's needs, again, we're taking a look at what is immediate or intensive, what action is needed, what are some things that we're just going to watch and wait, right? So again, those may not necessarily rise to the level of being included in the case plan, um, but we would be doing that as part, or I should say anything that's immediate or intensive or where there's action needed, we want to make sure that we have a solid plan in place for that. Um, and so we're also taking a look at all of those caregivers. So this discussion, again, is not just about the caregiver that the child is with, but it's 
in regards to all of the caregivers who are interacting with this child. Um, and so again, we want to make sure that we're identifying any immediate or intensive needs as well as um, anything else where action is needed. And safety is always going to show up on here because it is one of the items um, for CANS. Um, in addition to how is that caregiver able to meet their child's needs? And so we're taking all of that into consideration. And we are searching, what we're really striving for is consensus, making sure that everyone has had a voice in developing um, an option as far as what we want to do. Um, and that most of the members of the team can agree on something. And the few that don't agree feel like they've had an opportunity to reasonably influence that choice. So again, making sure that all of the voices are there um, we're also being really transparent about if there's a reason why something can't happen because, um, because of that child welfare intervention, those legal responsibilities, court orders, things like that, that that has been a really transparent discussion um, and that we are able to then, even with the understanding of those perhaps limitations, what are we able to move forward with? And so this is something that we have really been um, trying to bring in, again, is just this gradients of agreement. Again, so where are we at? Do we endorse it? Like, I love it. Um, are we agreeing with some reservation? I can live with it. Not really care either way, it's okay. Um, I'm not a fan, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm not gonna stand in the way of this. And then also, you know, again, the no way, no how. And this is um, when we do the facilitation training, we're, um, we, we do emphasize that we are always striving for the highest level of consensus, right? Like we would love for everyone to say, I'm in a, I like it, I endorse it, great. Um, and just because you have someone that says I'm neutral, I don't care either way, that doesn't mean we just continue to move on. Um, we are really trying to make sure what do we maybe what are we maybe missing? Um, what could we bring into the plan that would help you to feel better about this, that would really move you from when I can live with it to I like this plan? What would that look like? And so this has been a key piece of the facilitation training. Um, and again, one of the ways that we're making sure that we have family voice and choice throughout this process, and especially in the planning and um, that comes out of this meeting. So um, I will let Emma take her part again now with translating cans into target needs and strengths. Thank you, Joanne. Um, and Lisa, I, part of your question in the chat that I really loved, I think you had said, how do you get the staff to understand the connection between CANS assessment and case planning, which I think is just an excellent question. Um, for me, I personally do a lot of uh, coaching work related to integration of the CANS with the child and family team meeting process. And I really remind people that the ultimate purpose of that initial sort of mandated child and family team meeting is for the purpose of collaborative case planning. And I believe that sometimes we, we have lost track of that as the intent of that meeting because we get so busy and overwhelmed in child welfare. We're like, well, we just have to do the meeting, right? Like we wanna look good on our safe measures or our outcomes tracking. But it's very clearly written into the Welfare and Institutions Code and the law in California now for child welfare practice that we shall have a teaming process to inform the case plan. Now, one of the other things that I share with people is that if you were to take a poll of the room around what needs to happen for someone's life to get a little bit better, you'd get 25 different answers, right? Because we all come to this work with our own particular perspectives, experiences, the things that we have done with families that worked phenomenally well and, and the work that we did that was a total flop. That is not an effective way to figure out how to support people who are working through child welfare with our particular mandates around time frames, right? We've got six months for some families with young children to try to make significant progress towards reunification. So the cans, again, if we go back to that metaphor around baseball, it's the scoreboard. It's a way for us all to see and be on the same page about what the needs and the strengths are. Before we had the cans in California, I like to say that assessment happened behind a closed door. So we'd have behavioral health who was doing their particular assessment of a child often. We would have our substance use disorders professionals who were doing the addiction you know, perspective um, assessment of the parent. 
In child welfare, we used the structured decision-making assessments. We would talk more generally about what our concerns were for families, but none of us were actually sharing the full assessments that were being completed. And therefore we were not on the same page when it came time to develop a comprehensive plan for that family. So the child welfare plan might have all kinds of things put into it that actually don't align with those other plans. So I just try to remind people that we are more effective when we work together and we're much more likely to understand whether what we are doing is helping or not working if we can be on the same page with understanding collectively what those needs and strengths are. So I hope that's helpful. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about needs and how do we understand needs. So when it comes to thinking about the cans, we like to try to kind of put those needs into two different buckets. So background needs are static needs and are often things that cannot change. So those are the identified needs that inform our focus and choice of services and support, but they're typically not the focus of the intervention or action. These might be the needs that drive current behaviors and they may require attention in order to prevent other needs from occurring. And those can include cans items, as well as things that are not included on the cans, right? Because people are complicated. There can be all kinds of things happening in their lives that aren't captured under those domains. Target needs, those are the things that we really want to hone in on and build our interventions around. We believe that effective services and supports that target those needs will likely result in a direct change in that need. Changes in those needs also typically link to a change in our anticipated outcomes. And again, that's where we're building sort of our plan, our targets and objectives around. Anticipated outcomes, those are the effect. So that's where we think we will see something change or shift if we are doing a good job around addressing the needs. And those anticipated outcomes can also include strengths to build. You can go to the next slide, great. So again, this is just kind of that reminder around target needs, root of the problem, needs we're gonna take action on, and needs that by resolving them help to address those other needs. So we're gonna give you a couple of scenarios here. Um, so this is a young man, Andre, he's doing well in math last year, but he transferred to a new school when he went into foster care. He feels like he doesn't fit in well at his new school. He has a lot of anxiety about going to school each day and can't concentrate in class. As a result, he has failed two math tests. Next slide. Geneva transferred to a new school when she went into foster care, but she has made good friends and likes her new school, but the math is at a much more difficult level. She has failed two tests. After failing the last test, she started to have stomach aches before school, saying she doesn't want to go because she doesn't feel well. So what do you all think here? And um, we'd love it if you can respond in the chat. What do you think the target needs are for Andre and Geneva? There's clearly a need for both under both anxiety or school achievement. What is the need for Andre, the target need? It might be hard to do it without seeing the slide, but we can. <laughs> okay, so I see anxiety and mental health needs. Yeah, great. And what about for Geneva? School achievement. Right, so it's kind of obvious when you think about it. So when we're trying to figure out, we've got both of these young adults, you know, youth who were involved with, if we build a plan to support them around the incorrect target need, we're less likely to see that there is an actual change. So that's why it's really important to do that mental, you know, just critical thinking work when we're in the process of teaming to make sure that we're, we're working on targeting the right thing. Um, I think we can skip these just in the interest of time, Joanne. And then another important piece is understanding strengths. So obviously we have all of our strengths domains in the cans. Our centerpiece or useful strengths are evident and well-developed. They could even be a protective factor. They can be linked to a target need and help to facilitate change. 
They should include safety and acts of protection by a parent, and it could include a parent supporting strengths that do not meet that level of safety as we kind of define it in safety organized practice. When we link those to a need, these are strengths that support change. Strengths to build are strengths that require building efforts before they can be useful and may be something important to build and by doing so support change on a target need. And when we're kind of in the context of thinking about how all of these pieces link together, I think that something that's really important to keep in mind is that the shared vision, which is again, another process of what we're doing in this case planning meeting, combines both the safety goal, which is oftentimes focused, or focused about the parent, right? We're looking at the parent's behavior, their action or inaction and its impact on the child and therefore what needs to happen differently so that we are not concerned about child safety with the well being goal for the child. Um, and it's really important that ideally that sort of safety goal is, is identified before the CFT meeting, that that's a process that happens with the social worker and the family and their network to help to identify that. If not, we can work on it together. The well being goal is informed by the CAN. So that's really an opportunity to make sure that we're capturing information regarding the child's needs and strengths and strengths to be, build, to be built. And if the safety goal has been met, we may end our child welfare formal intervention, even if that well being goal is not yet achieved. Hopefully, there will still be services and supports in place to help to achieve that goal for the child or youth but there may not you know, still be a case open or a child in care at that point. Absolutely, and so just because child welfare intervention may end does not mean that the family's kind of done with the work, um, but it may mean that they don't need that continued court intervention because the family is really demonstrating that they are capable of meeting the needs of that child or doing the best that they can to meet the needs of that child in a progressive way, right? Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about how do you move from the shared vision to planning, because that's the tricky part, right, <laughs> is how do we make sure that our well-being goal and our safety goal makes it into a plan in a way that makes sense to everyone who's part of this team, right? And so we are we train facilitators to make sure that there that there's a part of the meeting where there's some brainstorming that happens right so they are able to think about or everyone's able to contribute some of their ideas about what could we do today what are some of the um based on the target needs right so if we summarize what those needs are what are some of the ideas that we have to address those needs and what are some of the strengths that we can use that we've already identified what are some of these family strengths that we can use as part of the plan or which ones do we want to build because we know that that would help support um, the youth or the family long term. So again, we're trying to figure out, get some ideas about services, supports, resources. Um, so this is not just a list of services, but this is really about what are things that people, the team members can do that help to achieve this vision. And we are trying to be as concrete as possible here. And then we're also building consensus around what will go into the plan. What do we need? What are the building blocks that have to be part of this plan in order for us to reach this goal. So again, that's the case plan or the treatment plan, depending on um, the family's intervention level, if they're with child welfare or behavioral health or with both. And so we have to make sure that we're getting those target needs identified. So just like the examples that were given, if we're addressing anxiety, then it's gonna look a little bit different. Our plan's gonna look a little different than if we're addressing school performance, right? Or school achievement. And so we wanna determine how and where in the plan the target needs are going to be addressed. What are the things that need to happen to address that particular need? Um, so we have a couple of different types of plans, right, that are coming out of our child and family team meeting that are informed by the CANs. And so we're going to look at each of these in a little bit more detail. So this action plan, these are going to be short term, very specific next steps that follow the CFT meeting. So these action, the action plan is going to change and it may change pretty regularly depending on when we meet. This is talking about who will do what and by when. And the question that Christine had in the chat around how are we monitoring things, 
we're taking a look at, did this action plan work? <laughs> did it achieve what we wanted it to achieve? So when we get to our next CFT meeting, we can say, yes, this worked or no, this actually did not resolve what we thought it was going to resolve. Um, so again, this is a very adaptable, this action plan. Um, these are things that we're going to do now that will have an immediate impact on the family and um, their overall well-being and safety. The treatment plan is going to be a little bit more long-term and then is specific to the child's behavioral health needs and functioning. So this is something that's not court ordered, right? Um, but it, it is not necessary to be completed for reunification to occur as Emma was saying, um, but we do wanna make sure that the mental health needs of the child and family are being addressed so that we are taking a look at like, what are some of the symptoms? How are we hoping that it's going to improve functioning? What would it look like, right? So we wanna get be as behaviorally specific as possible. The, the goal is not to tr complete treatment. The goal is for us to see behavior change that indicates that the anxiety is no longer there or whatever it is that it is we are addressing, that that has been resolved. It's not just a check mark of we've completed it. And then for the case plan, this is something that is court ordered and there are specific components that have to be part of that court ordered case plan. So we have to make sure that the case plan is very specifically addressing um, the parents' needs regarding harm and danger um, or whatever the safety threat is that led to child welfare's involvement in the first place. What the CANS helps us to do is to focus on the things that need to change. Um, and it lets us know that sometimes there are complicating factors, meaning that these are things that are kind of lower on our level of um, need for intervention, but they are things that can sometimes cause us to, to focus on them. It can cause us to worry a little bit more, but ultimately they're not necessarily related to, um, to safety. And it may mean that it's just kind of hanging out there. It's something that we're gonna keep an eye on to see does it rise to the level of being a safety threat or does it um, now make us more worried about um, that child's needs being met in some way for their well being or for safety. Um, and then we're also talking about the child and youth's needs in general. So as part of this case plan and part of the way that we're utilizing the cans in the case plan is to say, what is it that this child needs? And then being able to determine what does the caregiver need to be able to specifically meet that need. And we're able to identify um, what that would actually look like. And so it helps it to be very concrete. It also helps us to know what is the behavior that we're looking for from the caregivers in meeting that child or youth's needs. Um, so, and so we're, when we move from the needs to the plan objectives, we're turning those needs into goals, okay? So that it's very specific um, about what is our intention? What do we want to see as the outcome? And the behaviorally based case plans describe how the person's going to meet that goal. So again, we're focused in on behavior, not the completion of a service. Um, and so, and then the case plan should always address the target needs that relate to the harm or the danger. We can't address only well being goals. We have to make sure that the safety threat has been resolved, especially when we're talking about um, whether or not children can return to the care of their parents. We have to make sure that it's safe. Safety is paramount. And so that has to always be part of the case plan, especially in child welfare. And so with that, we're just gonna kind of wrap up our presentation. Um, and I know that there was some additional um, things in the chat. I haven't had a chance to read all of them, um, but just we wanted to open it up to see, did you have any questions? Um, and I'll, I'll ask Emma, did you wanna add anything else before we kind of open it up for questions for folks? Um, I included a, a link in the chat to a one page quick guide to integrating the cans into child and family team meetings. So you should be able to just click on that link, ignore anything that says you have to sign up. You should be able to open it, download it. Um, I think it's a really great, just quick and easy summary of this particular process. Um, and I'm just trying to go back through the chat and see, I think we tried to question some Get there was a question from Joycelyn, um, just a behaviorally based goals versus, um, and uh, what we would say is um, service completion goals, right? Because in child welfare, um, frequently before you would see like parent will complete a substance abuse treatment program, right? So just saying substance abuse was maybe the main reason that child welfare became involved. That was the main reason 
kids and we were worried about the child's safety. So a parent completing a substance abuse treatment program does not necessarily mean that they are caring for their child in any different way. Um, and so when we describe what the behavior looks like, um, we actually say that the substance abuse is kind of like the complicating factor. The behavior that we're worried about is when they're not, you know, feeding their child or the home is so dirty that, um, you know, the baby might crawl around and put things in their mouth that they could choke on, right? Like, so there's those kinds of things that we can actually say, this is what we're looking for, not just a checkbox that something got done, but that there's been actual behavior change that goes along with it. Um, because we would oftentimes have families that were, you know, if the case plan goal said you were going to do all these services and they did, and then on the child welfare side, we're thinking, wow, but we don't think that they're any safer than they were, you know, they're any safer now than they were when we first got involved. But it makes it very hard to articulate when we're only looking at services versus behaviors. What does it actually look like when this parent is safely caring for their child? Great, thank you, Joanne. There was another question um, earlier, just asking what does this process look like for your agency? Um, and I think we kind of laid out and this is what we would really consider to be a best practice, this clear flow of this organic CANS child and family teaming that informs this individualized behavioral based case plan for the family. Um, what I will say is that in practice, it looks very different all across California. Um, I work for the Northern Training Academy and we support the 28 most Northern counties in um, California, some of which are very small. We have counties that have populations of less than 10,000 people and then you know counties like Sacramento that have large cities in them. So what this actually looks like is very unique depending on the particular county and what their implementation of these practices is at this point. Um, we have some counties in our region where the social worker does all of the things. So they are the person who is trained in the CANs. They are the CAN scorer. Um, they're the ones who have all of those great engagement conversations to really come up with that draft CANs they bring it to the child and family team meeting. Sometimes they also facilitate that CFT meeting or there may be um, someone else at the agency or an outside contractor who facilitates the meeting. And then the child, the child welfare social worker is always the person who writes that um, case plan. We have some other counties where behavioral health is the one who completes the CANs, who does that CAN scoring. We really emphasize that the CANs is a draft and it's not considered complete until it includes that the necessary caregivers are rated. So if the child is in an out of home placement, any parent who is a party to the case plan who will have a court ordered case plan must have a rated caregiver section. In addition, those trauma domains have to be completed. And currently that is not a requirement for the CANS 50. That is a requirement for our county um, behavioral health clinicians. So it's a little bit of a sticking point still in our implementation of California. Anything else you'd wanna say about that, Joanne? I think you covered it. I, the thing I just wanted to emphasize is around, again, the caregivers and making sure that we're assessing all of the individuals who have a role in caring for this child. Um, and so, again, in a reunification type of situation, we have to make sure it's the caregiver that the child's living with because we want that child's day-to-day -day needs to be met. And we also want to be making sure that the parent is able to start demonstrating how they care for their child safely, right? And so it has to include both of those um, caregivers, not just one or the other. And so that's really where, you know, this idea of, um, of the different perspectives and making sure that we are really communicating across systems and um, amongst all of the individuals that need to weigh in on the CANs, that that's happening. Um, and so it's just really, really critical. And um, at times it can be it can be challenging to make sure you're getting all of those perspectives in and that we're assessing all of the right people. Um, and that's part of our goal with um, the child and family team. That's why that's a really great vehicle because we're bringing these people together more naturally as part of that process to be able to speak to some of those needs, right? And that they are naturally coming up in conversation and it's not just, this thing that happens outside of our conversations, but really it should be matching what we've been talking about as far as the things that we're most worried about or the things that we think are working 
working particularly well for a family. And I'm sure all of you who are here know that and are familiar with that concept, but sometimes we have to say that a lot for our California audiences, you know, that the CANS is not an assessment, right? It's that communimetric tool. It's what captures all of the assessment information and brings it together in a, in a centralized place where we can all be aware of what it is everyone who's working as a part of that child and family, you know, serving system and the family, the child, the youth, the parents and their network. Um, there was a question in the chat about where does the approval of the CANS come in? And again, it probably depends a little bit about where you work as an agency, but what is written into our, you know, welfare and institutions codes, kind of our across California policies, is that the CANS is the initial CANS is considered complete and can be entered into our, you know, CWS CARES live system after that case planning child and family team meeting after the draft scores have been shared with the team and we have come to a consensus about the ratings. So that's where we would say, okay, initial CANS has been approved. We're gonna upload it into our database and then it can be updated, right? Even before the next child and family team meeting, but absolutely by the time we get to our next meeting, which could be 60 or 90 days, sorry, six months or 90 days, depending on the case circumstances, we are revisiting that CANS. We're updating those ratings and hopefully we're seeing that there is some improvement. And if not, great indicator that we need to you know, work on um, revising the plan. And the CANS and the, um, the case plan are kind of happening at the same time. If we're talking about the child and family teaming process happening in the way that it's intended and for people to come to this meeting together to say, you know what, yes, we agree that these are the target needs and we agree that these are the family strengths, right? So that's the reflection of the CANS and getting a completed CANS within the meeting. And then once that agreement has happened, that's when we start to translate that into a case plan, right? Because you can't really determine what are some of the things that need to happen until we've all agreed on what is the thing that we're even addressing, right? And so um, they happen a bit simultaneously, but with a lot of preparation prior to coming into the meeting. So at no point should folks come into this meeting and be like, we're just gonna do the whole process today. We haven't talked about the cans. We've not talked about the needs. <laughs> no, like everyone's here for the first time. No, there's a lot of preparation that has to get to that point so that you can hopefully develop some consensus. Um, and again, that you can get support from the entire team around what are those target needs and how do we want to address them? And then that becomes part of the case plan. So I hope that it answers that last question because yes, you should not be completing your case plan without a finalized CANS. So, so you, again, this is all kind of happening at the same time with everyone's agreement around what we should be targeting and what um, the outcome should look like. If there are any more questions, we have, I think, one more minute. And if not, I just wanted to thank you all so much for joining our presentation today. I know it was a lot of information in a short period of time, um, but the PowerPoint is available on the website. And again, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for your great questions. I, I love the questions in the chat. And thank you, Joanne, for co-presenting with me. Thank you, Emma. And again, it was a pleasure to have all of you. Thank you for being thoughtful in your questions. And I do hope that this has been informative and um, maybe gives you some ideas about how you can um, utilize the CANS and case planning or other meetings that maybe you have within your organization. So we appreciate your time and your attendance today. Thanks so much.